Welcome, Dolphins fans, haters, and everyone in between to your favorite show discussing the greatest franchise in sports, the Miami Dolphins. This is the Fins Pod. My name is Moose, your host, and like Tom Brady, I am back. We have a ton to get into today and over the next few weeks as the Fins Pod gears back into the swing of things. For now, we're going to talk big picture. Look at the moves that Miami has made thus far, specifically on the offensive side of the ball. Tyreek Hill. To Ron Armstead. I have no idea what the hell happened to our team, but I am loving it. And we're going to discuss how we as fans should be feeling under this new regime with Mike McDaniel. I missed all of you, and I appreciate all of the Twitter shout outs requesting hurry up and get your ass back. We're back. I'm excited to be back, and let's get this thing rolling once again. Strap up, get comfy, and let's dive in. There's no doubt about it. The Dolphins have shifted a lot over the last few months. Obviously, the firing of Brian Flores, which was met with a ton of division. Like everything in the world, two camps emerged, right? Those who agreed with the firing vehemently. They were like, look, it's a no-brainer. Miami had to go in a different direction. And then there's those who felt Miami was making another dumb Dolphin move, specifically people at the national level. But where do I stand, simply put? I don't know. I don't know if Brian Flores will get another opportunity and shine elsewhere, win championships for another franchise. I don't know if Mike McDaniel is the real deal, but what I do know is the team really had to part ways with Flores. This offseason, it would not have looked this good if Flo was still leading the charge. Not only was it clear and talked about on the show many times that Flores did not support Tua, it also became clear that players in the locker room, specifically on the offensive side of the ball, felt like there was no plan, no vision. And we saw that. In three years with Flores, he did manage to build an elite defense, but just could not figure out how to manage and put together a competent offense. Not a good offense, a competent one. He was unable to do it. The most prized and valuable investment that our franchise has made in this past decade, Tua Tungavailoa, his career hangs in the balance as a result. If he fails then this rebuild that started a few years ago is also a total failure. And Flores did not, for some wild reason, feel like he was tethered to Tua. And that that's really become clear now that Deshaun Watson has gone to Cleveland and all those rumors that he was coming to Miami died right after Flores' departure. And like we were saying the whole time, it didn't make any sense. Watson was not coming to Miami, and look at that, he's in Cleveland. We saw that when he would bench Tua, Flores, rather than allow him to learn and grow, he wasn't actually behind his quarterback because your young quarterback is going to go through growing pains, especially when he's coming off a major injury. So maybe like bear with him a little bit. And we also saw that there was no support from Flores in the way that he spoke of Tua. You cannot succeed if your quarterback doesn't succeed. And it's clear to me that Tua and Flores did not have a good relationship. And we'll know who was right eventually. It'll take a few years, and it's all on the shoulders of number one to prove that Flores was wrong. Because Stephen Ross and Chris Greer, they have put themselves on the line for Tua. If he fails, then of course Flores was right. All of his leaking to the media, the consistent Tua bashing being allowed to continue, rather than him coming out and making a strong statement, statements we've seen Mike McDaniel make in mere months of being here, rather than Flores with Tua for years, unable to even back him a little bit. But if Tua succeeds, then he was the one holding the franchise back, and Flores was dead wrong. If Tua grows and shows that he's the quarterback that we thought he was, then we know we made the right choice. And Flo was not empowering Tua Tungavailoa to take the reins of this team and succeed. So where do I stand on that about Tua? What's going to happen with him? <laughs> Easy. If you're a longtime listener of the show, then you definitely know. I believe that Tua Tungavailoa has the potential to become one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. He needs protection, a system which highlights his best traits rather than playing around his weaknesses like we saw Flores do time and time again. He will succeed. We just have to wait and find out. Now, speaking of providing him protection, our Dolphins have done exactly that. It is no secret that Mike McDaniel, the run game coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers, prior to him becoming the full-time offensive coordinator, it's clear he wants to run the ball, and he took over a team 
which flat out could not block, pass block or run block. You were not getting any of that with this unit. Overhaul was necessary. Every fan knew it. Any fan of an opposing team that faced the Dolphins knew it. We needed to identify pieces who can improve the unit and then the offense as a whole. It was necessary. And a few weeks back, the Dolphins did just that, coming to terms with the top free agent on the market, Pro Bowl left tackle Teron Armstead. Now, obviously, that move has been overshadowed by a certain cheetah, but we'll get to him because this signing, it cannot be understated. Armstead had previously spent his first nine years with the New Orleans Saints, and now at age 30, he joins the Dolphins on a five-year deal worth $75 million with incentives that could make that contract worth up to 87 and a half. Of that, 43.37, which is an oddly specific amount, is guaranteed. It's a big contract, no doubt about it, but a player that this team needs. To, complete, to be completely honest, it is a really good contract when you actually look at it and realize you're signing a top five tackle in the league. Because tackles are hard to find. We would know that better than most. If Armstead hypothetically doesn't hit his incentives, he misses games, then his deal of $75 million, it makes him the 12th highest paid player at his position. If he does hit his incentives, meaning he was productive, likely has you know, some Pro Bowl berths in there too, then he's the fifth highest paid tackle in the NFL. Considering he's in his prime and he hit the open market, this is a pretty good deal for the Dolphins. Now, who is Teron Armstead as a player and why was he even worth it? Why should we feel like one man can elevate a whole unit? Simply put, look, he's an incredibly large man, six foot five, 300 pounds, but he's also an incredible athlete for his size. Famously, he ran a 471 40 yard dash at the NFL Combine. It is still the fastest 40 time for an offensive lineman or a 300 pound man in general. His quick feet allow him to mirror defenders perfectly, always staying in the right position, using proper leverage, and being able to play head up and in control of athletic defensive ends. Last season, it felt that nearly every time Tua stepped back into the pocket, either the left or right tackle would have allowed leakage, and someone is coming to get Uno. The ripple effect of that is astounding. Tua would either have to deliver a pass before he's ready, prematurely before the route's there, or he has to step up in the pocket too early to avoid a hit, taking him off his spot and messing with the timing of the play. Just being able to get one edge locked up, it's going to do so much for this team. If that defensive end tries to go inside, Armstead uses his power and strength to keep them out of the interior of the pocket. If they try to loop around around the edge, Armstead's got great feet and they let him ride the defender out, forcing a loop around the quarterback. That's where that pocket comes from. His hands are also incredible because I'm not sure if you've seen a picture of this guy or seen the interview, but his arms are definitely a standout feature. They're long and he is jacked. His strength is apparent. Most big boys... They got a ton of muscle, of course, but they also have a lot of blubber covering it up. But if your arms look like an NBA power forwards, but you're built like an NBA center, that's pretty impressive because that reach and his strength, he gets his hands right on defensive ends, not allowing them to dictate what they want to do with their pass rush. Now, a lot of people have suggested moving him over to right tackle. He's a vet. He can probably make the adjustment smoothly, even though it is harder than people think. And of course, Tua is a lefty, so the whole left tackle, the most important position on the line thing, goes out the window because that prevailing thought is for every other starting quarterback in the league who are righties. And as a lefty myself, I just want to say, you right-handed people don't even know your privilege. This whole world is built for your basic genetic asses. Try buying a, a baseball glove when you're a kid. You got like 40 cool options, none of them for you, and then you got your like four shitty gloves as a lefty. But off that tangent for Tua as a lefty quarterback his blind side is at the right tackle spot so all that value would be more worth it at that position but at least right now I do reserve the right to change my mind if if you know these things do change or we see what ends up happening at right tackle but I don't really want to see them make that move Teron Armstead has established himself as an all pro tackle on the left side he's comfortable there if you want to get the best out of your player right away you play him where he's going to perform best. If you want to maximize that investment, you take him from where he succeeded and put him there on your team. And that's at left tackle in the case of Armstead. So plug him there. And now, thanks to the huge move, 20% of your offensive line is, dare I say, really, really good. 
I mean, there's a first for everything. Honestly, this signing kind of reminds me of the Brandon Albert edition back in 2014. It was good for the team, and his ultimate failure probably had just as much to do with the coaching staff, but Albert, of course, had issues in Miami himself, the same issues that Armstead has had in the past. It's the reason, realistically, Miami got this stud left tackle at a relatively affordable rate. Injuries. Armstead has never played a full season and often gets hurt midseason, Never anything too serious. He hasn't missed an entire year or anything, but he averages around 11 games a year. Let's hope that we get him fully healthy. But again, like we should know, injury-prone players often default back to that label. They get hurt. It's part of life. It's not really their fault, despite what Twitter has you believe. It is just the way things are. It's a physical game, and not everybody is able to hang in for 17 games year in, year out. That's why availability is so valued. We can hope that Armstead plays 15 to 17 games, but the reality is we're probably going to brace for 10 to 12. But the reason I don't really care and I'm still going to take it is simple. The alternative is so much worse. Miami does not have reliable tackles outside of Armstead, and we'll get to the other spot in a few minutes, but Armstead, when on the field, is borderline, frankly, elite. His presence single-handedly raises the level of play for this unit, and to be honest, we don't even know the extent of the impact that he could have for the Dolphins in the long run, because Armstead is also known as being one of the best veteran leaders at his position, a great locker room guy. The team's offensive line is young, extremely young. Some of them are going to be given an opportunity to compete. I'm looking at you, Austin Jackson, because remember, Jackson is, and I shit you not, 22 years old. 22. That's a baby, and he is a vet in the league already. Still a baby. Should Miami have taken him 18th overall? Hell no. We know that. But he's on the roster, so let's adjust the way we look at him. Draft value aside, he is talented enough to be in the league, although Twitter didn't really make it seem like that, and we had our fair share of roasts. He can be a backup, definitely, in the league, so if he loses the competition to start at right tackle or one of the guard spots, then he can become your swing guy. Despite how bad he was, I don't hate him from going consistent starter to swing guy that you need in a pinch. And the upside, the upside is still there. His experiences will not only help him as long as his confidence isn't entirely shattered. Not that us fans really helped in that regard, but we did kill him during his trash play, deservedly so. But again, he's 22 and the addition of Armstead, a guy nearly a decade older than him, a pro's pro, could be monumental in his development. If Armstead takes him under his wing and shows him how to do it, Maybe Jackson could put it together. He's in the mold of Teron Armstead, right? AJ is also 6'5 and over 300 pounds. He is still raw. And it's not like he was going to get great coaching with the regime before, so we might not actually know what he can be yet, considering that whole staff has been wiped out. So all things considered, Teron Armstead now donning the aqua and orange is a thing of beauty. What other additions did the Dolphins make? Well, sticking with the offensive line, Miami acquired veteran guard Connor Williams. Previously, Williams was with the Cowboys, and he isn't guaranteed Pro Bowl caliber guy yet, but let's be real, he's significantly more talented than anyone that Miami had, aside from maybe Robert Hunt. He signed to a really reasonable deal, and the Finns are getting him on the upswing. He is still pretty young, despite being experienced and being part of a leading rushing attack. He's only 24. He's got the potential to be a key building block for this offensive line under Mike McDaniel, and we know there's going to be a shift in the way Miami wants to attack you on the offensive side of the ball. We spoke of it throughout the season, but what was the Dolphins' identity on offense? What was it? Flores, George Godsey, Eric Studsville, they couldn't get a grip on what they wanted to do. Inconsistent play calling, poor development of talent. There's a reason that the offensive unit sputtered and stalled throughout games. We know there's talent, it just hasn't been unlocked. Hopefully, McDaniel and his staff can get better production out of these pieces. And in terms of identity, just look at the Niners. What they are is a run-focused team, which tries to wear out opposing defenses. That concept, that same idea in Miami, it's a perfect match. Just look back in our history. The best Dolphins teams were the physical teams that grinded you down and were able to make big plays late in the game. So yeah, you do want to be able to run the ball at will. But off of that, you then take shots downfield, use play action, and attack all levels of the defense. There's a reason San Francisco 49ers were consistently deep in the playoffs despite always being underrated. 
They always seem to overperform, but they were really that good. They play a style of football that works in any era. You establish the run, try to get four to six yards on every carry, occasionally break a few, force defenses to show their hand, and load the box. Then throughout the drive, throw the ball downfield. Get it to your playmakers with the space that you've now created with this established running attack. It got the best out of Jimmy Garoppolo, but to be honest, Tua, I believe, and feel free to attack me, but Tua is going to prove to be a far better quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo. Give that style of offense to Tua, let him master it, know where he wants to go with the ball. He will thrive. Last season, and this frankly blows my mind, the Dolphins had the worst rushing attack, right? We, we all know that. Well, guess who relied on play action passing the most? The freaking Miami Dolphins. So the main concept that you want to use to pass the ball last year as the Dolphins, the times you put it into his hands, you generally use play action. Led the NFL. Okay, well, you know, Flores, that play action is usually built off of a running game. So how do you figure that'll work out for you? It's just an example of how the previous staff, as great as they were at defense, could not handle offensive play calling at all. They had no idea what they wanted to do. They had no idea how to maximize their talent. Mike McDaniel is trying to do that here. Now, getting to the move everyone has been talking about, the Miami Dolphins traded a haul of picks for all-star wide receiver Tyreek Hill. Boy, oh boy. Guys, we have Tyreek Hill. It's been a week, and I still need to pinch myself. The most explosive weapon in the NFL. The guy who made eye-popping play week after week. Always seeming to be on SportsCenter Top 10. He's in the aqua and orange. Firstly, though, what did we give up for him? Well, Miami sent the Chiefs this year, 2022, a first-round pick, 29th overall, a second-round pick, and a fourth, as well as a fourth and sixth-round pick next year. Is that too much? Oh, my God, did Miami overpay in terms of draft capital? Hell no. You can question his contract, right? Four-year extension worth $120 million with $70 million guaranteed, now the highest-paid receiver in the league, he becomes, honestly, he deserves it based on what he's done. But that that number over Devontae Adams, over Cooper Cup, although Cooper Cup will definitely surpass him once he's up, I believe, in a year. But regardless, scared money don't make money. I don't care what anyone tries to tell you. This was a home run move for the Dolphins because we've talked about the identity that the Dolphins likely want to have on offense. Hard nose, wearing out the opponent, and a little flashy, too. And what I mean by flashy is Miami's going to try to establish the ground game every single week. With this improved line, Miami should be able to get something going, hopefully, and in turns, opponents are going to have to load the box. Here's the thing, though. What would you rather have happen to you as a defense? Get gashed five to seven yards on each carry or get burned over the top? Because if Miami's able to become a top half rushing unit in the league, not even top 10, just top half, although they have potential to be top 10, Opponents are going to have to respect that part of the game. Not only does that create opportunities to stretch the field, but it also allows for the play-action pass to actually become potent. Look at that, Flores. You actually have to be able to run the ball first. Tyreek just needs half a step before he beats any corner in the league. His speed alone changes the way defenses have to guard you. Not to mention, he's paired with another kid who I don't know if you know is pretty fast too, Jalen Waddle. With both of them on the field, you got to pick your poison. My guess, in the beginning of the season, teams are going to give deference to Tyreek Hill. He's earned it. He's the star in the league. He'll get the coverage shaded towards him. But that's only good news for Waddle. He was Miami's main target last year, and he was the focus of the defense. Yet he still broke the rookie record for receptions. Now he's going to have even less attention paid to him, opening up more opportunities for big plays across the middle or down the field. Later in the year, when defenses wise up to the fact that two is probably more comfortable with Waddle anyway, they'll then start shading coverage over to him. People won't think that two and Tyreek will be nearly as productive, but here's the thing. Why the hell not? It's not like Hill is a one-trick pony. He's not a Will Fuller speed receiver. They're very different players. He's Tyreek speed receiver. That means give him the ball, end rounds, quick screens, shallow crossers, slants, 15-yard digs, or hell, a nine route. He is versatile and very underrated when it comes to route running, something that Miami can utilize when trying to mess with opposing defenses. I don't think Tyreek's success is only dictated on Tua. I know Tua's going to get him the ball if he's given time, 
I believe Tyreek's success in this offense and the rest of the passing offense's success is going to be dictated on whether we are able to finally unlock the running game. If we are a bottom-tier rushing attack again, then Tyreek and Waddle will not be able to maximize their skill sets. But if we can establish a ground game, a, a respectable one, then we got fireworks in Miami. We will get a lot deeper into the weeds of how this offense will look, types of plays they should be running in order to best utilize their new toy. But I do want to touch on one thing. This Tua slander. Holy crap. Everywhere you see, people are dogging our quarterback. Whether it be national media heads, local reporters, or even people within the fan base, a ton of haters are out there. Let me tell you something. Tua Tungvaluwa has one major problem. Just one. And that's idiots with no understanding of football talking out their ass. Firstly, as Tyreek Hill stated, he is one of the most accurate passers in the game already. Check the stats. Watch film. He absolutely is. And he absolutely has enough arm strength to make passes down the field. Everyone just forget his deep passes tend to be pretty accurate. And what I don't understand is how people can assume that he's already trash when he was playing behind the worst offensive line. You know, the thing that almost single-handedly dictates whether you can throw or run the ball, the O-line. If anything, you should feel like his grade's incomplete. If you're going to be negative, you should say, look, I don't know if two is going to be good. I'll take that because, frankly, how could you know? that's something that's unknown to anybody um, except, well, go on Twitter or ask Chris Long. He seems to really know two is already trash. But if you think he's already trash, then stop looking at the box score and actually pay attention. Think of two as deep to intermediate throws this past season. How did they look to you? Yes, you, the person who actually watched to a play. I'll tell you what I saw. I saw a guy who will put the ball in great positions for his receiver time and time again. He allowed his guys to make plays over and over. Ask Devontae. Rarely would he overthrow a guy streaking downfield. Rarely would he throw consistent picks when airing the ball out. He's too accurate. The simple truth is, when you don't have time to allow routes to develop, then you won't be able to throw downfield. Also, the few moments that we did finally get an opportunity, then the coverage had to be right. Too many things go into deep shots that people don't consider, and if you're not able to protect or run the ball, then trying to take a deep shot is counterproductive. You're trying to chip away. You're trying to move down the field. Why waste it down on a deep shot when in reality you're not going to be able to get it because they're not loading the box on you because they're, they're stopping the run with a standard front seven. So as a quarterback, it's hard to get into a rhythm when you're being attacked constantly and then asked all of a sudden to step up and throw it deep. Because honestly, Tua's internal clock is probably messed up as the game goes on because the six dropbacks prior to the deep shot resulted with his face in the dirt. So again, getting into a rhythm has been hard. Now, assuming that we do get an improved offensive attack, a better running game, smarter play callings, actually utilizing our talent properly, then our young quarterback, he will shine. Keep those receipts. Guarantee you, these fools are going to look silly come the fall. The move, though, that was made over the weekend that hurt my soul. The Dolphins decided to trade Devontae Parker, which I understand when you consider all the re receiving weapons we now have, and they traded him with the fifth-round selection for a third-round pick next year. Now, in terms of pure value, it's a slam dunk. Parker's a talented wide receiver, but his skill set no longer meshes with what the Dolphins are likely going to be doing come the season. He's a possession receiver. He lacks speed and separation, although he is a monster when competing at a high point. We've seen it. His injury history and lack of consistency, though, did make him expendable, as well as the new wide receivers who have entered the room. A third rounder for him is really excellent at this stage in his career, but my problem is we sent him to the New England Patriots. An in-division trade is extremely rare, but for some reason, the Dolphins have a history of helping the Pats out. Obviously, we know about Wes Welker, now coach for the Dolphins. Love to see that. He turned out to be a potential Hall of Fame player for New England. Then you got Malcolm Perry and Isaiah Ford, two guys who did not pan out as well, although the book is still out on Malcolm Perry. Now, Miami has decided to help New England and Mac Jones by delivering them Devontae Parker. Why? Why help a team fighting for positioning alongside you in the AFC and in your division specifically? The move, it does kind of remind me of last season's draft trade with the Eagles. Instead of giving up San Francisco's pick, which ended up being 29th, Greer took a gamble on his squad and shipped our first rounder. He was like, you know what, Philly? We're going to be so much better than the Niners next year. Take our pick. I want theirs. Yeah, that didn't turn out great, right? But 
I did like the confidence. It proved to be a bad decision, but I like the confidence. This kind of feels like it's in the same vein. Do I love that the trade signifies that the Dolphins aren't scared of New England? They're like, hey, take him. We got X to cover his ass anyway. Absolutely, right? I, I love that. 2-0. Tua is 3-0. and Sorry, not 2-0. and 2-0 and is against them. Mac is 0-2 against us. And the Patriots have only regressed from a personnel standpoint, right? They've lost their stud guard in Shaq Mason, another starter in Ted Karras. And on the defensive end, they've replaced J.C. Jackson with washed-up Malcolm Butler, who just came out of retirement. So I understand there's no need to fear him. The Dolphins are a better team on paper and likely will be on the field as well. And again, we have wide receivers to spare. But if things go sour for us, there's injuries, Mike McDaniel is not what we thought he was, and New England somehow finishes ahead of us, and if Parker is a productive contributor to them, this move was a mistake. I do love the cockiness, but I'm wary of the result. What about you? What do you guys think of Miami sending Devontae Parker for pretty high value, but to a division rival. Let us know in the comments below. Now, stepping back from an overall offensive perspective, the roster is already upgraded. Just look at it. Specifically, the offensive line as of now, you got left tackle, Teron Armstead, left guard, Connor Williams, center, Michael Dieter, right guard, Robert Hunt. Honestly, those four, kind of love it. Right tackle, Liam Eikenberg, and or Austin Jackson. It's not perfect, and again, upgrades can and likely will be made but it is so much better than what we had in our 9-8 and eight season last year. In terms of weapons, you have much more explosive weapons in the backfield. Miles Gaskin and Savan Ahmed, they're going to have to fight for their roster spots. I think Gaskin has a shot, but Ahmed is going to have to be competing now in a much better room. Raheem Mostert, a player with experience under McDaniel and someone who, when he's healthy, which is rare, is electric. In his career, he averages 5.7 yards per carry, and that's over seven seasons. His issue, just like Armstead, has been health. But also like Armstead, he is an established stud. We're not taking a gamble on an injury-prone guy who we don't know about. No, no, watch where he most highlights. The man knows how to tote the rock. But the first option and the one who got paid more, so I do expect him to have a bigger role, Chase Edmonds. Edmonds showed he could do it all in Arizona. He's as good a runner between the tackles as he is a pass catcher. He has the speed to bounce it to the outside, be a zone runner. He showed that in Arizona. And again, he's also a plus pass protector, and he can really catch the ball. Considering that he was one of the first announced signings in the entire league, I do think that we are going to use him quite a lot. Miami identified him. They went at him early and got that deal done. They wanted him. So I'm curious to see how McDaniels wants to use him. Alec Ingold has been brought, brought in to play fullback, a more prominent position in this scheme. So we're going to be one of the few teams with a fullback. We'll see how that turns out, what he adds. All I do know is from an athletic skill, skill set standpoint for a fullback, he's good. Of course, he can get in the trenches, knock back a defensive tackle, but he also showed with the Raiders he could run out into the flat, catch a pass, go get you some yards. Jalen Waddle and Tyree Kill, they're likely going to be moved around the most. And again, we'll get more into the specifics of what I want to see. We know what Waddle provides, right? But under McDaniel, we'll probably see him used in a far more unique way. Outside of Tua Tunga by Loa, give me a name, please, just to excite the Dolphin fan base where you are looking at the roster and you're like, oh, I can get I can get something Waddle out of that guy. Okay. Waddle. Cedric Wilson is an exciting get, too. He was buried in Dallas. And to be fair to him, I mean, you got Amari Cooper, CeeDee Lamb, Michael Gallup. Wilson had to claw for reps, and in his opportunities, he showed out. He's got good hands, high points the ball well, he gets separation, and he can actually make guys miss once he gets the ball in space. Miami needs more of those guys, right? That's what we wanted. That's why we shipped out Devontae Parker. And another guy who I think is going to get an opportunity in this offense is Lynn Bowden. Because if he has really put in the work that it looks like he has, specifically with Tua 2, then he could be an X factor for this team. He's the guy no one is talking about, but in, in, in all honesty, I think everyone's going to know his name come the fall. Because if you want to look at a Debo Samuel type player, yeah, Tyreek Hill has kind of been lumped in, Jalen Waddle, but just from a skill set standpoint, that's Lynn Bowden. If you don't remember, go back, watch his highlights. He is shifty as hell. And a great runner. He can actually lower the shoulder, too. 
He can flat out make guys miss. He's quick, explosive. I think he could be used in the slot and be a contributor in this offense. Surprisingly, the Dolphins also retained Preston Williams on a low-money deal. Again, Devontae Parker's gone. We do lack size in the receiver department. I don't really think that's the type of offense we're going to run. We don't need big, tall guys on the outside. We need fast guys running across the field. But having a red zone threat or someone who can go up over the top with size, that is still valuable. So we'll see if Preston Williams has a shot to make the roster. If the piece is fit, if McDaniel is as good a coach and communicator as they say, then we're really in for a fun season. I'm hopeful, but then again, I always am. Thank you for listening, guys. We will catch you later this week. Fins forever up. How do you guys do the same and use your skill sets to help Tua develop as a quarterback? Well, Tua is one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the NFL, man. So just his ball placement, you know, getting us the ball in space, you know, perfect placement, you know, and us just utilizing our speed, you know, use, um, utilizing our best asset, you know, just, and, and that's just being dangerous. That's going to do it for us here today. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Fins Pod. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, as always, to Timothy Ritchie, Brian Googer, and Chris, members of the pod and supporters of the show over on Patreon. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you all so much for the continued support. And please remember to like the video if you enjoyed the show. Subscribe just so you never miss a chance to chat about your Miami Dolphins. Also, remember that the show is available on all platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and, of course, here on YouTube. Continue the conversation with us over on Twitter and Instagram, at FinsPod. I hope you all have an amazing day, and until next time, stay safe. Love y'all.